Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. So glad that you're joining us online wherever you're at if you're in the car at the office or wherever you're working at from home we're glad that you're with us we are in this final part of our series we did a four-part series going into the new year on habits because you know so many of us we will set up uh, goals we'll say hey these are my resolutions this is where I want to go and we get inspired we're fired up but that often doesn't change an actual habit. Sometimes just effort alone will, but many times it's not. We're kind of left, kind of feeling like we have uphill hopes and downhill habits. And so we're gonna talk about how to really make a difference and change our habits. We've been really doing that over the last uh, three weeks. We're gonna conclude with a very important part of, uh, that really affects all the other ones. Now really it comes down to uh, putting God first. This is really what it's, you know, saying, God, I want you at the center of my life. If you help me out, you're going to find you're going to have a lot more energy, a lot more focus, a lot more ability. You're going to have this divine intervention. God's going to come alongside you. He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you strength. And, uh, and so that's really the foundation of this. <clears throat> Take your outline out. You'll see here it says, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. That's the way God likes to do it. We try to, you know, set goals and s put all these exterior things on us, and that can help. But God says, really, the thing that changes and, and has lasting change and the most profound change happens from within, within us. And so God wants to change us from the inside out. He says, so we start with God. He says, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. <clears throat> so God wants to bring the best out of you. So that's a, that kind of proposes a question for us. Is the best coming out of me? Now certainly for me, I would answer no. There's still more to go. God's still in the process of working great things in me. And the chances are it's true with you as well. So how do you make that happen? How do you let the best come out of you? Well, you let God start that formative work. And he does it through relationships. See, here's the thing. <clears throat> we, we are a product of our habits, right? You, you show me your habits, and that's going to be who, who you are. And it's true about our relationships. Our relationships have the most profound effect on our life than anything else. And so we want to make sure that we have the kind of relationships that helps us to grow into the person that God wants us to be. So having solid relationships, having good relationships is important. So choosing my relationships carefully, that's habit number four. The habit of choosing. I get to have a matter in this. I get to have a say. I'm going to choose the kinds of relationships that will, that will help me out, that will line up my life with the way I want it to go. Your relationships are the most important decisions you'll make in your life. Look at this verse. I love this. It says here in Proverbs, it says, a mirror, everybody knows what a mirror does, right? It reflects your face. You look in a mirror, you say, hey, that's what I look like. But there's something that reflects something even more true about us. He says, but what, is, what we are really like is shown by the kinds of friends we choose. When we encircle that word choose, we have a say in it. What you choose. Now, certainly as you were growing up, you didn't always get to choose the people that influenced you. We had sometimes uh, family members, people that, you know, we kind of inherited those friends, so to speak. But as you get older, you do get to choose those. 
You get to choose who you're going to align your life with, who you're going to allow into your close friendship circle, and, uh, <clears throat> and that reflects who we are. And, uh, and it says a lot about who we are. So re- when it comes to choices, I want to talk about four relational choices. They're on your outline, four relational choices. Number one is nurture my important relationships. Hopefully, you all have important relationships. Important relationships where people that are very important to you. Now, if you're married, certainly that's going to be your spouse. That's an important relationship. And you need to work at your marriage. Some people go, oh, my marriage isn't what it used to be. It's not the marriage's fault. <laughs> it it's, 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 takes work. And sometimes people think, oh, yeah, because it takes so much work to make my marriage work that there must be something wrong with it. No, no. Actually, it takes a lot of work. It takes, I've been married almost 30 years. It takes a lot of work, I can tell you. A lot of work. You know, you, you get a fire going and you lay down. You go, oh, this fire is so nice. If you wait too long, right, the fire starts going out. You got to get up. You got to poke it. And sometimes you got to go outside, put your slippers on, go get a log, come in. Throw a new log on. It's, it's, what's wrong with this fire? Man, won't we'll just stay out. No, you got to add to it. You got to keep adding. That's what keeps it going. Now, certainly when it comes to a marriage, it's harder to start a fire that's gone out completely. So, you know, but you can do it. And God is glorified when we do that. Even if it's totally gone, you still put some work into it. Some people go, yeah, look at other people. They've got it easier. You know, the grass is not greener, friend, on the other side of the fence. And even if it is, I can guarantee you the water bill is higher, right? <laughs> That's absolutely true. But the grass isn't greener on the other side of the fence. It is green where you water it. So you got to work at it and put effort into it. Your important relationships you cannot neglect. You've got to put the effort into those. First Peter 4, 7 says, 7 and 8 says, the end of all things is near. He says, hey, Jesus is coming back. This is, there's some imminency with this. Therefore, be clear and minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And we're starting a new prayer series next week. And I hope you can come and be part of it. It's four weeks. It's going to be an amazing time where we get together and we learn how to really communicate with the most important relationship of all, which is God. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I love that where it says love covers. Love covers. Now, we live in a culture today where there's not a lot of love covering a whole lot. I mean, somebody disagrees with you about something, they don't love you, they hate you. You know, and there's this divisiveness, dissension. This is all of the devil. Listen, love covers. And we need to take a different stand, not just on politics, but in all of life. We need to be a people that march to a different drum. It says love covers. Another relationship choice is this restore my broken relationships. And we all have those, right? Relationships that aren't doing all that well. And you restore them. Now, it's painful to restore. It feels easier to neglect it. But the truth is, it's actually more painful just to leave it broken than to actually try to fix it. Because when you fix it, then it gets better. Or potentially has the chance to get better. Now, certainly, some relationships cannot be fixed because it takes two people, right? And the Bible speaks to this. It says, do not repay evil for evil, but if it is possible, and sometimes it's not, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So you want to live at peace with everyone. The the most important person to live at peace with is is yourself. And that happens when you do what you can to restore broken relationships. You got to, you got to make the effort. And a big part of that is forgiveness because we hurt each other, right? We're always hurting each other, either unintentionally or sometimes even intentionally, sometimes small ways, sometimes horrible ways. So we got to, as Christ followers, we're called to ooze forgiveness. Jesus says this even in in the Lord's Prayer, right? There's only six elements. He says, this is how you pray. He lays out six things. One of those daily is to forgive. He goes, forgive as I have been forgiven. And that's the connection that Jesus makes, and we see all throughout the New Testament. Why do we forgive? Because they deserve it. No, they don't deserve it. We do it <coughs> because we need it. It's for us. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, if I, don't, if I 
if I uh, don't forgive them, if I harbor this unforgiveness, it hurts them, you know? So it's like, if I set myself on fire, they'll die of smoke inhalation. That doesn't work like that. And it hurts me. And so you'll never be the successful person God wants you to be if you hold on to that unforgiveness. And so this is so important when we're restoring relationships is to forgive. Colossians says it like this, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Now he gives the reason. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. You see, I need forgiveness. And, the, and, and God says, if I'm not willing to give forgiveness, no matter how horrible it was, what they did, then, then I, I'm, I've kind of cut myself off from the source. So I receive this flow of forgiveness in my life as I forgive others. Here's a third choice you can make. Sever any harmful relationships. Sever, or at least redefine, any harmful relationships. Now, I'm not talking about your spouse, right? If you're married, you can't go home and go, hey, Andy said, you're out of here. You know, it's not what I'm saying. It might be harmful, but that's not the one you sever. So you need to stay married. If you're married, you need to stay in it, and you need to work on that. But you sever harmful relationships. Because they're harmful for you. They're hurting you. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You have relationships in your life that are not spurring you on to good works, to great things. They're not your champion of your, of your dreams and what God's doing in your life. No, they're, they're chipping away at it. And so you need to change that. When I came to Christ at 18, I didn't know any Christians. And so when I first met my first Christian, I would introduce him to my other friends, you know, like he was a unicorn or something. You know, like, hey, this is a Christian. Whoa, really? A Christian? Yeah, man, this is, and I'm one too now. You know, it's just like, wow, this is weird. But my friends that I had before I came to Christ, they were not wanting me to do great things in life. And so as when I became a Christ follower, I, I didn't have this language, but I had to start changing my playgrounds and changing my playmates. I had to change some of those things. Now, it doesn't mean I cut myself off from all those people because I still wanted to have an avenue to share my faith with them. But as far as my close friendships, the people that I let in and shared my dreams with, no, no, they were not those people. So you want to make sure you have people in your life that are championing, you know, championing the dreams that God's doing in your life. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but he who is a companion of fools suffers harm. That might indicate, that might talk about some of your relationships. So you, you're going to sever those harmful relationships. Then initiate some meaningful relationships. You need to have meaningful relationships. People that are like mentors. People that champion you. And listen, th those, are, those are more rare. They really are. You actually have to usually go out of your way to almost strategically make sure those people are in your life. You have, to, you have to do more than, it doesn't just fall into your lap. The people that, that will mentor you and champion you, those people, those, you have to kind of like go out of your way and say, I want to create this relationship in my life. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. But you, if you're, that's a habit that you've got to form. That's something you choose. I'm going to have this in my life. And they're out there. You start praying about it. You start looking around. God will show it to you. And you put those people in your life. And it does take work. It does take work. It takes work, particularly if you're a guy when you think you can do it all on your own. Hey, man, I don't need people. I'll just do it on my own. Well, you do need people. And if, as you get older, the older you get, we tend to become uh, filled with less friends. You know, young people, they have a lot of friends. The older you get, I mean, sometimes it's just attrition, right? That people move. And, but after a while, we just Oh, that's just true with, as you get older and older and older. My mom turned 80 this past week. I flew out, and, and I was with her at her 80th birthday party. She didn't want any gifts, but she wanted funny cards. One of the funny cards she got was this old lady on it. She goes, the older I get, and then you open it up, and it says, the less people I really like. The reason that's funny is because it's true. She, and she said that. She goes, ah, that's true of me. <laughs> uh, sure it is, because that's true of all of us as we get older, so we have to be careful about that. That we don't just end up all alone. And that's a choice. That's a choice. Sure, other people have idiosyncrasies and things we don't like and opinions that bother us. But listen, we need to make sure we have 
people in our lives that mentor us, that challenge us. It's doable. And the, and the New Testament indicates that the default is that we would be isolated. And we could make that into a habit. Notice the way he phrases it. He says, let us not give up meeting together. I love the way, you know, you could have said it differently, right? Like, let's make sure and stay, to, you know, meet together. But he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the, what? The habit of doing. So it's almost like the default is, yeah, the, the default is, is to get into this place where you're in a habit, you're not meeting together with people that can encourage you. He says, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, that word day is capitalized, because that's referring to the day when Jesus returns. And there's this imminency again. Hey, we need to be doing things right today. We need to be doing things right. How can we master the habit of relationships? On the back of your outline, notice with me four things. And I'm going to try to release you early because we have our tailgate party going on with our small groups, and I want you to be part of that. Okay, number one, develop my relationship with my church. Develop my relationship with my church. Now, I put my church because I think everyone should have this phrase in their life, my church. I, this is my church. Now, this doesn't have to be your church, but I, certainly you're invited to make this your church. We'd love to have you here. But you need to say, this is my church. I don't just attend. This is my church. Now, some of you are attending, and that's fine. I think that there's a season in our, in our lives where sometimes we just need to be attending, where we're not contributing anything, we're not doing anything, we're not serving in any way, we're just receiving, we're just coming and being filled up. That's a great, there's nothing wrong with that. And if that's you, I'm glad that you're there. But listen, you can't stay there forever. At some point, you need to say, this is going to be my church. I'm no longer going to be an attender. I'm going to be a member. When I first met Sharon, at, when we first were uh, seeing each other, we kind of have an attender relationship. You know, we, I would pick her up or she would pick me up. We'd maybe go out to dinner or something when we were dating and maybe see a movie, I don't know, go get some frozen yogurt, and then we'd, I'd drop her off, and goodbye. See, I was an attender. I just wanted to hang with her a little bit, but not too much, you know. <laughs> Is Sharon here? Let me make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be careful how you say these things, you know. <laughs> but at one point, I, you know, I want more than an attender relationship with her. I want, a, I want more. So we got married. I had, we had a wedding. I was a member. Yeah. <laughs> Membership has its privileges <laughs> and its responsibilities, right? I love being with her. I mean, I wanted more. And listen, with all relationships, you, unless you're committed, you'll never get the most out of them. And that's true with the church. That's why it's so important for you at some point for you to say, this is my church. Now, again, there's this 10, 15, 20 great churches in this area I could recommend. If you're wanting to know, come up after service. I'll be, I'll be happy to tell you. This is not the only church, but this church, it's, for some people, it's, it's my church, and I invite you to make this your church, where you say, hey, those drums, those are my drums. You know, those, the coffee out there, it's my coffee. These chairs, these chairs are my chairs. You see a piece of paper on the, in the hallway, you go, I didn't drop that, but it's my church. I'm not going to leave it on the ground. I mean, making it my church. This is important that you, that you, because it's part of stepping into the family of God, what God has for us. The Bible says it this way. You are members of God's very own family, not attenders. You are members, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. So if you're going to get the best out of your relationships, you've got to make a commitment. Number two, develop my relationship with godly friends. People who care about you. People who want to see the best happen in you. How do you know if they're godly friends? Well, it's, it's simple. When you're around them, they're spurring you on to be more godly. You want to be more godly. When you go home, you th all of a sudden you have thoughts, hey, I want to read the Bible. I want to, yeah, I wonder what they were talking about when they were quoting that one verse, and I'm going to research that some more. I'm going to spend more time in prayer. I can't wait to be around them more because they make me want to be more godly. That's how you know, okay? So in case you're wondering, well, I think they're a Christian. Well, uh, th that's fine. Hang out with that person, but the kind of person I'm talking about, 
there's no question in your mind. They're, they're, they're challenging you and encouraging you to be a more godly person. And you need that in your life. We need that. The New Testament says that we are supposed to meet in bigger gatherings like we do on the weekends, but also from house to house ministry. The, the, the Bible actually uses that phrase, house to house, where we're involved in each other's lives. This is the value of small groups, which is the backbone of this church. Notice there it says <clears throat> that uh, it says they, all the believers met together constantly. They're talking about small groups and shared everything with each other. So circle that word shared. They shared. What did they share? Well, they shared. One of the things they shared was who they really were. You know, they got to a point where they could share their true selves. We all wear a mask. All of us. I'm wearing a mask right now. I'm not going to let you know all my, my, my secrets, all my things, right? If I'm discouraged, I'm not going to let you know. I'm here to encourage you. But I need a place where I can go. I can take off that mask and I can say, hey, man, I'm not doing well. I'm discouraged. I'm, I'm, I'm having some problems. I need somebody to encourage me. I need somebody to pray with me. This is the value of a small group. And so I encourage you to be involved in a small group. Now, the reason we do semesters is just so that it's kind of an on-ramp. Small groups that have been meeting on and on for years and years, those are real hard to break into. And so what we do is we take breaks and we kind of play musical chairs and we have new leaders and new subjects and people kind of move around. And this week begins our our 13-week semester. So if you would take out your outline on the very back, I've kind of given you a, a roadmap on how to get involved. Just kind of step by step <clears throat> how to get involved. We have what we call free market small groups. Free market meaning that uh, you can just try different groups. You, don't, you, you know, sometimes finding a group takes two or three or four times. And so I would encourage you to go out to the tailgate party we're having, which is you don't have to have a truck to be part of that. You just go out. We have free food, some amazing food. Meet some of the small group leaders. Talk to them. And, I mean, they're doing different things. It might be volleyball or a marriage uh, group or a parenting group or a financial group. There's all kinds of groups, recovery group. But really, the, what the curriculum is more of the hook. I want you to meet people. That's, you know, I know you go, well, hey, Andy, that's awkward to meet new people. Well, yeah, we'll get over it. That's part of, that's part of not falling into this trend where you're just isolated and alone as you get older or if you're a guy. And so you push through that, and, uh, and then you, get, you contact them. Before you go over, call them up. Hey, what's up? And, you know, you start talking to them. You might realize, oh, man, this person's weird. You go, well, okay, I'm not, I probably won't be coming. No, no, come on, come on. Woo! I'm not going there. You make a couple phone calls, and then one of them you'll find out, you'll go, wow, I think that could be a relationship that might end up being something for a long time, maybe all my life. I can't wait to meet this person. And you make those connections. That's our free market. You go, wow, that's kind of mean to the small group leaders. No, they know that. They, I mean, they know how, that, how, how relationships work. I mean, they just kind of, they, they happen organically, right? But you got to take a step forward. We're doing what we can to make it easy for you right here. You get to meet some of them. You get to hang out with them. But you step into it. You go, I'm going to be part of a small group. Because that's what the New Testament tells us to do. That's what God says we need in our lives if we're going to, if we're going to grow. You know, there's a correlation. We do a survey uh, every year or every other year. And, that's, and there's a direct correlation to what kind of godly influences you have in your life and if you're in a small group. I mean, it's a direct correlation. People that are not in small groups have very few, if any, godly relationships in their life. And so you've got to change that. You got to change that in your life. Now, the third thing you want to master is develop my relationship with a team. And we have something we call the dream team. We have hundreds of people that are serving on the dream team. They're serving in different capacities. <clears throat> They're serving uh, the, the poor in our food pantry. They're serving in other kinds of compassion ministry. We serve uh, parents that are in need with crisis with their teens. We do Bible studies. We do all kinds of stuff, ushering, all kinds of teams. Very cool stuff. But you know, the best part of serving on a team is being on the team. You do it together. You know, I mean, most of us played some kind of team sport or something with a team when we were kids. 
That's half the fun, right? You're on a team, and that is part of the way God designed it. When we do things together as a team, the celebration is much bigger than if you just have a private win. Your own private win, there's plenty of people that have private wins. God designed this to be part of a team. You know, in the NFL, there's 53 players on the rosters of the, w that play on a team. So today's Super Bowl Sunday, there's 53 guys that are potentially could play. When they travel, you, you know, you'll see them getting off the bus. Well, you know, to have those 53 guys show up to play, <clears throat> there's 3,700 other people making that possible. 3,700 other people. Just for example, real quick, I mean, just for them to get on the bus, somebody had to drive the bus, somebody had to schedule the bus, somebody had to schedule the PR meeting so the cameras would be there when they got off the bus, somebody had to run the camera, and just on and on and on. 3,700 for 53 people, because you'll never do something significant alone. It always takes a team. Ecclesiastes verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 says, There was a man all alone. Could there be a more sad phrase? There was a man all alone. <clears throat> he had neither son nor brother. And because of his loneliness, there was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with all his wealth. He had plenty of money. That's not the problem. But God did not design us to celebrate that kind of stuff alone. Two were better than one because they had a good return for their labor. So I invite you to be part of a team. We have a great team here. I mean... I'd love to share with you some of the vision that God's given our church. We have terrific vision, and we're looking for people to say, I want to be on that journey. And the way you do that is you go through steps one through four, growth track. We do that every week. Today is step one. It's a perfect time to get involved. Now, if you have not taken growth track, you're, you should not be out uh, do, joining a small group. You should be joining step one. That is going to be your small group. That's where you get in. That's your on-ramp for you. If you've never taken uh, the growth track, because that's and we're going to have all the some of the uh, the barbecue, a lot of the great food outside. We're going to have it in there anyway, so you're gonna, not going to miss the food. We want you to be involved in that. You step and you go. You know what? I'm ready to be part of the dream team, a team that's making a difference. And you make this say, hey, this is going to be my team, and I invite you to, be, to do that. So immediately after this service, or, or not this service, after the second service, if you look now, notice this here. I wanted to go to the last point. Develop my relationship with God. Develop my relationship with God. He says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, then you will find me. Then you find me. It's almost like if you're not looking for me, who knows what will happen. But if you look for God, he goes, then you will find me. Being all, what would, what would it look like? Have you ever thought of that for your own life? What would it look like if you were all in for God? All in. I mean, that does a lot for any relationship, but certainly your relationship with God. God, I'm not going to hold anything back. Most of us, we kind of go in and we're kind of going real timid, timidly, like, oh, I'll see, you know. What if you were all in for God? A lot of times we go all in for a lot of things. You know, people, there's people that are all in for sports. Their, their football team, I mean, they got a team they root for. They love their football team. They'll go to the game. They'll go early for the tailgate. Or they'll park a long way away because that's the parking they can afford. <laughs> and then they walk all the way in. You know, but they don't think any. They got a big grin all the way. They're walking two miles. <laughs> they're, they're just happy. They go in. They spend all their extra money on paraphernalia. And then when the little pigskin starts floating around, man, they're, they're freaking out. They're yelling and screaming and clapping. And we call them a fan. But somebody who gets excited for Christ, we just call them a fanatic, right? Yeah, I'm not a fanatic, but I am a fan of Jesus. I'm a fan of Jesus. And listen, why give your very best to a team that does not even know your name? As opposed to God who created you in the first place. That's, the, that's what it's talking about when the Bible says putting him first, seeking God. He says when we seek God like that, he's going to reward us. He'll, we'll discover something not only about ourselves, but something about God. It'll fill our lives with meaning and purpose. We'll have strength where we didn't have it before. We'll, have, we'll be able to break habits kind of like almost miraculously. 
that we're just kind of like God's divine gift into our lives. Amazing things happen when we put God first. Let's close in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you care enough about us to break into our little world and tell us that we matter to you. And this is a word for you. If you're here today, you're wondering, you know what, I've, I'm not sure if I should go all in. I'm inviting you right now. This, there, there's no better relationship, no better decision you'll ever make than say, I'm all in for God. So why don't you just say that in your prayer, just between you and God, this is not about my church. This is, this is about your relationship with God. We just say, God, I, I'm going to serve you with all my heart, with your strength, with all my heart, all my mind, all my, everything I've got, all my soul, everything. You say, God, forgive me. That's the starting place before we, in broken relationships, all begins with that word. Forgive me for my transgressions, my things that I've done wrong, big and small. And would you say, God, help me in my relationships. Help me choose wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.